All right, hi everyone. Welcome to Hacker School Introduction to ReactJS. Today, we are gonna, of course, learn how about ReactJS together. And yeah, let's begin. So over here, you see this link over here, bit.ly slash hs2021 react. I'm gonna just paste it in the Zoom chat as well. So basically this link will contain a document with all our materials that we'll be using today. So it would be nice if you could just start loading it up early so that you can just see where all the links are. All right, so let me just give a short introduction of myself and Sissing. So today we are the ones that's going to be teaching this workshop. I am currently a year three CS student and both of us are NUS Hackers core team members. For myself, I personally use React for NUS mods and in my previous internships in Indeed and Carousel and other places. So uh, for Sissing, she basically was in a at an internship called CBWO where she used React extensively as well. So Today's we will be, we'll be the one giving this workshop. Okay, so today the things that we're gonna we're we're gonna cover basically is just uh, what is React and what is JSX and key React concepts, and we're gonna do something that's pretty fun, which is to make a to do list app together. And you, as you can tell, this is actually quite a lot to cover. So basically, before we begin, we're gonna just uh, set some expectations first. So yeah, we only have two hours and um, perhaps we might even overrun a bit. So just mentally be prepared for that as well because there's a lot to cover. And this workshop actually just aims to bootstrap you into the process of designing a web app. So it's not meant to be super comprehensive. We'll just focus on the key concepts and the fun parts about React, all right? And we will also go very fast. So you might feel a bit lost and it's actually completely fine because that is by design because we're also experimenting with a new interactive online workshop style where there will be exercises for you to try during the workshop and in the process you will face difficulties but that's completely fine because you can just kind of look at the answer the, the answer okay and you'll just try to read and follow along and understand the code and you'll be fine all right so we should also understand that by the end of these two hours, you will not become a React master, okay? Because it's just, there's just so much to cover about React. It's just really to get you started on making stuff. There will also be a list of strongly, like highly and extremely recommended reading resources. So um, they are all actually in the doc, in the Google Docs already. So you can just go and like look at them after the class if you want to. But for now, you can just follow along. Okay, um, so how this workshop will work is basically I'll just uh, explain certain React concepts, then we'll just live code with the mentioned concept and you'll just be given some time to practice or read or understand the code and we'll just keep doing this again and again. And we'll be using Code Sandbox a lot. So Code Sandbox is this website that's like um, very useful for like helping us get started with writing a React app. So all the links that we, are, we will be using for Code Sandbox will be inside this link over here. You see this thing at the bottom of every slide, so just uh, try to keep it open. So today what we'll be making is we'll be making this to-do list here. So let's just take a look at how it looks like. All right, in this to-do list, um, yeah, basically um, it, it just looks kind of non-discreet over here, but you are actually able to like uh, add a new to-do, for example. So today I need to teach hacker school Right, then you see this thing over here and if you can just mark it as completed and when you mark it as completed you see this uh, number of tasks it will like kind of drop down and you can even change your name so you can change your name from like john doe to like chris okay then um when you do this when you refresh the page you still see all your previous uh to-do lists and your name and the number of uh, tasks you have left 
And there's also this very interesting cat fact of the day here that refreshes whenever you refresh the page. Okay, so that's what we're going to make today. Uh, it looks kind of boring because uh, the, our, our first workshop, okay, in fact, this is the only workshop we're going to be having for React this semester. We'll only cover about the very basic to-do concepts, like the, the very basic concepts. That, but if you want to like look at the second part of the workshop, which uh, we will not be teaching this time round, but the second part of the workshop, we actually make something like this. Yeah, so this yeah. Uh, hang on, let me mute the participants. Okay, she's muted. Yeah. So um yeah, so this this is the nicer version that was built on this version. This this was covered in another workshop, but it will not be covered this time around. It will be linked at the end of the slides. All right. So yeah, let's move on. So first thing first, I think for those of you who are here, you are not exactly familiar with what React is. So I'm just going to talk about, introduce React to you. So um, we are going to talk about what is React and how does React work. Okay, so React is an open source JavaScript library that's used for building front-end applications. It's created by a Facebook engineer and is currently being maintained by Facebook. So you realize, okay, your, if you go to facebook.com, the Facebook app is entirely built in React. And a lot of web apps around the world, they're all built in React. So for example, uh, Instagram web, your, you have Straits Times. And if you, you are NUS student, you use NUS mods. NUS mods is built in React. And uh, if you are a NUS computer science student, you have used this thing called Source Academy. Source Academy is also built in React. A lot of apps these days are, are built in React. So it's one of the more famous tools that's being used to make a web app these days. Okay, so before we begin, let's just have an understanding of how web apps work. So usually you are the user and you are using the web browser, right? And what happens when you visit a website? When you visit a website, your web browser essentially makes this thing called a HTTP request, okay? And you will try to ask, you will try to get a website that you request for. So this, we call this a front end, okay? So this is what you see. Then the front end will basically try to retrieve certain process data from a back end. So this back end can be built in something, uh, can be built in a lot of tools, but people usually use things like Express or like Ruby on Rails or Flask or etc. And then this back end will try to retrieve certain data from like a database. So a database usually is built with things like Postgres or like MongoDB or MySQL. And basically once it gets the data, it will just send the data back to the front end and that's the front end will basically serve the information to the browser, which is how you would use a web application. So don't worry if this is a bit too hard to understand because we don't have to fully understand this. It's just to give you a rough idea of how web apps work. Okay, so like I said, when you when the web browser receives the front end, basically it receives it in terms of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. And HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files, basically what you need to know is HTML just defines the structure and the skeleton of the website. The CSS is just add styling to the website. So it, it makes you know, things look nicer. It makes your buttons have rounded corners, for example. And what JavaScript does is it just makes the website dynamic. It makes it interactive. It, make, it allows you to interact, interact with the website. So that's the purpose of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we also just quickly recap about the document object model. So this is the DOM, which is used inside the browser. So what happens is your browser will receive like a HTML file. Okay, so in this HTML file, it, it looks kind of something like on the like what you see on the left. Okay, but it will be converted by the browser to basically like a tree of elements. So this tree of elements basically just uh, tells the browser how to lay out the content and um basically how to display it. So this gives like a hierarchical view of how the content specified in the HTML is laid out. Uh, there's a question about will this session be recorded and shared later? Yes, this session will be recorded and shared. So you can just visit the same uh, bit.ly link at the bottom and you will see the recording link after the workshop is over. Okay, so once we have this DOM tree, this DOM tree will get converted by the browser. It will be rendered by the browser to actually uh, have this uh, elements over here. Okay, so this is how basically from HTML, it becomes a DOM tree and the DOM tree will be rendered by the browser to be an actual working web app that looks like this. 
So in the past, when you kind of click on the link on the website or you visit a URL, the website is always reloaded. Okay, the server will always send back a new HTML file for each request, even if some parts of the page look the same. So for example, if you were to visit Wikipedia, you see that okay, it has probably has like a header or left sidebar that is shared amongst all its pages. But whenever you click on a new link, the the even the sidebar or the header that's similar will still be reloaded. Everything will be reloaded. So that's how um, web pages used to work and they still do now. But that's what React is trying to be different. So we want, we'll introduce this concept called a single page application. Okay, so this basically means this application is just one single page. And when you move from page to page, it doesn't reload the entire page. Okay, we, it just tries to figure out the difference, okay, the, what it needs to re-render and it just selectively re-renders that part by mutating the, the document object model using JavaScript. Okay, so only the elements that require the change will be re-rendered and a React web app is actually a spa. So if you go to a, a lot of the website that use React, you realize they usually feel more snappy, they feel more responsive because when you click on link to link, it doesn't reload the entire page. Okay, it only reacts. Okay, it only reloads the, the portions of the content that needs to change. So how does React know what needs to be changed? It uses a diffing algorithm. So diffing algorithm, when we, call, when we say diff, we just means like trying to calculate the difference. Okay, so a diffing algorithm is just to compare two items and identify the differences between them. So for example, if you use things like Git, okay, Git is like a source control tool. Git uses a diffing algorithm to identify changes to your files and it only commits the changes to your files. And that's how you can think about it. So React actually maintains a separate DOM. Okay, so the DOM that I talked about just now was a browser's DOM, but React actually maintains a separate a virtual DOM. And what basically what it does is uh, all the changes that are received by the virtual DOM uh, will then be propagated to the browser DOM. So let me just talk about why this is useful. So let's look at the virtual DOM here. So perhaps this, would, this might be what the React virtual DOM would look like. And for example, you had this green component here that you know, it's like a child of this, but it's a parent of this component here. Maybe this green component receives some new data and it requires a re-render. So instead of re-rendering the entire page, what it happens is it will just calculate what needs to be re-rendered. And it realized that, okay, just myself and the child needs to be re-rendered. And it will just re-render selectively the, the parts that need to be re-rendered. Re so as a result, your page just feels more responsive, feels more snappy. You don't have to reload the whole page. So why do people use React? <coughs> okay, so people use React because React is very fast. It only changes elements that needs to be changed. Okay, it when you visit a website, it kind of gives gives you like a native app like performance. You don't really see like pages being having to load for very long periods of time, and the different algorithm is very fast. Okay, React is also quite intuitive. So even though React is purely in JavaScript, right? Uh, it uses this thing called JavaScript XML, so JSX, which actually allows HTML in JavaScript. So for example, if you were to be using JavaScript to just like add a div that says hello world, you will need like these three lines of code. You need to first create the div, then you need to set the text of the div to make it hello world, then you append it to your, to your HTML DOM. But the thing is, if you were to be using React, you'll be using something called Java's JSX. Okay, uh, you'll be using JSX, and you basically can just inside your React code itself just use uh, something that's very similar to HTML. Just like you know, you see your div text here, and you can just kind of use it as a JavaScript code, and it will just work. Okay, so React is also very widely used. This there's a enormous large community around that a lot of people who use react and as a result you get a lot of very good high quality support okay there's a lot of articles on react out there if you face a problem chances are if you were to google for it you'll be able to find someone who has faced the same problems as you and of course there's a lot of packages so um, because of the number of packages you have you don't actually need to write uh, we implement we implement a lot of the things that you need yourself so for example if i were to uh, be writing a web app that requires me to drag and drop items. I can just install a package called React drag and drop instead of writing the drag and drop functionality on my own. 
Okay, other than that, React is also extensively documented okay, on, on the React uh, web page. So if you're ever lost with your code and you're wondering what uh, API methods to use, you can just go and visit the documentation and chances are you will answer your question. Okay, so um, there are two main ways of writing React code. So basically, the first way is to write it with class components. So class components is what React started out with. Okay, you actually see a lot of uh, class component codes uh, still floating around in the world today. And because that's what React first started with, but we are not going to cover this today. But it's still very important to know and understand React. So after this workshop, you can actually just click, click on this uh, official React tutorial itself and you'll be able to just learn about class components. But today what we're going to cover is we're going to cover about functional hooks components. So this is what most people are using these days because it's a lot simpler to write components, okay? And it's simpler and more declarative, okay? You just write a function and then you just return your JSX and it will just kind of um, render as expected. So we call this a functional component because it's really just a JavaScript function as you can see here, okay? So let's finally start to make our to-do list. All right, so like, like I mentioned previously, uh, JSX basically allows HTML in JavaScript. So uh, let me just quickly show you how it kind of works here. So over here, we have this uh, component that's called hello world. Okay, this, there are two different ways of writing this. So you can write a hello world component in terms of like an arrow function function. Okay, so this arrow function, okay, you, you see this curly bracket here, what it returns you, it just returns you a div that says hello world. But this function here, this isn't an arrow function, this is an actual function. You can also write it this way, just have a function that's called hello world and it just uh, returns a div with uh, hello world. So both works the same way. And the nice thing about this is you can actually compose components together. Okay, okay I may repeat, you can compose components together. So for example, I have this other component that's called big component. And this big component uses a few components. Okay, so in this case, it, it might be using like the hello world component. So I can actually just in like a HTML notation, just write, hit, no, just write a component it and say, hey, I want hello world here. And what happens is when you actually run this code, it will just expand to this div, hello world div. Okay, let's, let's just look at that again. This hello world will just expand to div hello world div. Okay, so I, ho I hope you can see how this will be very useful for you because it allows you to segment the parts of your web app into very small modular components that you can reuse. And you can also just put them together. And as a result, your web page code becomes very neat. You have very modular small files just sitting around. Okay, and there are a few rules we need to follow for JSX. Okay, any JavaScript in JSX must be enclosed within curly brackets. So over here, we have this JSX tag that says it's a div, right? But in, in between here, suppose we wanted to show like, um, like show use JavaScript to calculate something, then we have to wrap it within this curly brackets here. Okay, and any HTML and CSS attributes should be in camel case. So although, although in, um, although in um, normal HTML, you have to, just use things like class or like uh, certain HTML attributes. Uh, you just lowercase the name and just type it out. But when you are when you use JSX, you have to type it out in camel case because in JSX we have to differentiate between the HTML attributes and the JavaScript uh, JavaScript terms. So for example, in this case, we use class name. This is the same as your CSS class. Your CSS class we call it some class, but over here we have to call it class name because if you were to use the term class, it will kind of uh, have like a name collision with JavaScript's class, all right? Which is why it, this is class name. And uh, there's a question that asks, uh, to use JSX, do we have to load certain libraries or just plain JavaScript? Uh, to use JSX, you just, have to, you just have to import React. So when you import React, React basically just uh, does everything for you and it will just set up the... Um, the JSX support for you, okay? So uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask in the everyone chat. You don't have to just direct message me because uh, there's people around here 
uh, the thing will be helping to answer your question. So you can just ask in the everyone chat. Okay. So yeah, the, for the first exercise we'll be doing today, okay, is uh, basically we have this code sandbox over here, sandbox zero. You can visit this sandbox zero link and what you see here is something on the left. So we are not going to, so I'm just going to quickly run through how we're going to do this. So the task here is to transform what we see on the left to what we see on the right. Okay. Well, as you can see, the top left box, the top right box is just uh, missing certain elements here and we are just trying to make them look the same. So what we're going to do here is I'm just going to give a quick demo of how we'll do it. Okay, so over here, what you see here is, uh, is the code sandbox link and I'm just going to sign in first. Uh, you can choose to sign in or not. Like if you don't want to sign in, that's fine as well. But if you sign in, you, you get to save your work better. So uh, usually once you open this link, you'll just be able to edit it directly and it will be yours. Okay, so that's a nice function of a code sandbox. So what you see here is you see all our React code uh, and you, you what you want to click on is you want to click on this browser button. So there's this browser button on the right, click on it. What this gives you is it gives you a live preview of your code that's on the left. Okay, so, so suppose over here, I'm going to change this to like, uh, welcome to hacker school. Okay, and then I'm just going to save it. Okay, what you see on the right, you, you see welcome to hacker school being reflected over here. Okay, so the task here right now basically is we want to add content to the top left box and the top right box. And it's basically how we're going to do it is uh, like over here, you see that um, this, top, this, this box on the left, it has this overview title. So uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to write JSX. So it will be something like H2 and uh, let's just say like uh, overview. Okay, and if I were to save it, right, it will just look like this. And okay, then if I were to add like a paragraph tag, okay, then I can just add like content below. So some content. And this is how you get this to work over here. And there's a certain very nice things that come with a code sandbox that we'll be using today. You don't have to care about code formatting because suppose my code is extremely messy now. Okay, I just make everything more and more unreadable. Right now they're all in a single line. The moment I save my code, the moment I save my code, it will just automatically format your code for you. Uh, assuming your code is properly written, it will just format everything for you properly. So you don't have to worry about code formatting. Everything is set up for you. Your syntax highlighting is done. Your live preview on the right is done. In fact, if you wanted to interact with your web app like that, you can even just visit the link that you see that's generated for you by Code Sandbox and you'll be able to just uh, access it like that. Okay, so um, yeah, so right now I've briefly introduced Code Sandbox. I would just like you all to just, you know, spend some time playing around with it and we just try to work on the first task, which is to turn this into this. And we have, uh, I will give you around like four minutes to just uh, try this out. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat.
Okay, I'm going to begin in 10 seconds. Okay, I hope everyone has been able to have some fun with the code sandbox. And I'm going to continue to just you know, quickly run through how it works. Uh, yeah, so over here, uh, basically we're trying to make the content the same. So as you can see at the top, we needed a title. So uh, at the top, we can just have a heading one. So over here, you can have a heading one and just say like a uh, hacker school, for example. And, and so this title will show up. Then we will, we will start on the left and the right boxes. So over here, you can have uh, welcome back, Chris. Then uh, over here earlier, we saw that it was bolded. So you can add a strong tag. This strong tag just indicates that, you know, it, there will be some emphasis here. So slash strong. Then we have another tag that will say, okay, um, you have four tasks that are not complete. Then we'll just bold this again. Strong and slash strong. Okay, so that's for the left box. Then for the right box, it's basically the same thing. We can kind of just copy this. And we can just change this to add fact of the day. Then we have we can have some cat fact here, some cat fact. Yeah, so that, I hope this gives you a rough idea of you know how writing React code is a lot, a lot simpler because of JSX, because we can just write HTML inside the JavaScript itself. So you'll get something like on the right. And I, uh, yeah, and of course we needed to add a few more items, right? So we just have a table row here. Then we'll just add like another two rows. And slash TR, okay. Yeah, so let me just make them look different. Yeah, okay. So that's basically it for the first exercise. You can change the number rings and stuff if you want to make it more complete. All right. So yeah, so that this is basically how you know React with JSX works. And I hope you know this environment, you're comfortable with it. Um, so let me just quickly run through the what's happening over here. So over here, we have this um, code. This Our source code here is called app.js. So this app.js is basically uh, our main entry point for the React application, okay? We, we also have this index.js. So this index.js, what, what you realize it does, it, it, it will set up all the React stuff for you. It will, it will, it will re import the required libraries from React and, um, and just render it. So over here is rendering React in strict mode and is rendering your app component. So your app component is inside this app.js, which is why we see this thing appear on the right. So this app, dot, this app component here is really just a function. Okay, you see this function is called a, is a function. And over here, we are just returning the JSX as the function's uh, output. And over here, we export default here because uh, usually when we use components in React, um, when we import components on React, we usually just make use of the default export. So this is a JavaScript thing. JavaScript has imports and exports, but over here, we're just using the, the default export. Okay, and inside here, we also have some CSS styles. So you see like header box, you see like, um, you see header box and stuff. So header box actually resides in this style sheet called styles.css. Okay, inside styles.css, you see in header box, this is our CSS style. We also have this app style over here. Okay, so that's how this works. And now I'm gonna move on to the next portion. So in the next portion, basically what we're gonna do is we are gonna talk about React state. So state is basically data that is stored in a component that's, that makes it stateful. So basically you can think about it as, it's the information that you want to keep track of while your web web is running. So for you to use a state, you need to import this React hook called use state. Okay, so you realize that for this import itself, you, there's this curly braces here. That's because 
this is a named export from the React library. So we need to import it as a named import. So we, we, we just import it this way, okay? And we can just use it uh, in our code in such a manner. So if you, you just use the use state hook, okay? Basically, you just need to specify a default value here. So this will be the value that you'll be initialized with. And it will, it will return these two variables, okay? It will just call, the first one is called the, the name of the state. And the second one is a setter for the state. Okay, the second one is a setter for the state. So this function allows you to set the value of the state. Okay, so this is still a bit vague at the moment. It's hard to understand, but I will just go through it. So the first exercise is a guided exercise. And uh, I, I think I forgot to mention this, but you realize in this workshop, you see a lot of references to something called Orbital. So this workshop was, the materials for this workshop was originally, originally prepared for this program called Orbital. But you, I hope that gives you some context of why you see Orbital all around, but yeah, so that's just some background. Okay, so we're gonna talk about having a state now. So, so over here, this is what you see uh, what we completed earlier. So this is, if you click on the link, this is what you can start with. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, so what we're gonna do here, we're gonna make it such that we can click on our name. When we click on our name, a box will pop up and, uh, and allow us to change our name. So basically what, how we do this is, um, okay, we, we're gonna need to store our name in a state somehow. So we'll just uh, import use state from react so this allows us to import the the use state hook okay then over here we we'll declare that we want uh, a hook to store our name so for the hook to store our name right it, it always starts with the name of the state okay and then it starts with a, a setter for the for the state that we want so in this case i'm going to put set name and we're just going to initialize it with some default name. So the default name that we can just set, maybe can be John Doe, something along that lines. Okay, so right now we have this state variable here and we want to display it inside our web app. So instead of showing a hard-coded crease, right? Okay, we, if we want to display JavaScript, again, you use the curly braces here. Inside the curly braces, you just write, write name. Okay, so over here you see, welcome back John Doe. So what we want to do now is we want to make it such that when we click on it, it allows us to change the name. So for us to do that, we need a, something called an onClick handler. So this is the same as like your default HTML and JavaScript uh, event handlers. We'll just be using this onClick handler. So this onClick handler basically it allows you to write uh, like JavaScript to specify what happens when you click on it. So, okay. Uh, when I click on it, what, I, what, what will happen is, okay, let's just have a prompt, okay, that to store our new name. Okay, so this is the default JavaScript prompt function, basically a box will pop up in your web browser. And then we can just ask, what is your name? Okay, then after we get the new name, what we want to do is we just want to set the name to the new name. Okay, and we're just, we're just gonna try it out. So if I were to click on John Doe right now, a box will pop up. And then the box will pop up if I type, my name is Chris. Okay, and I click on okay. And what you see is, welcome back Chris. So what's, gonna, what's happening here is when I click on it, okay, it asks for what is my name, and then it will just set the name to the new name. And this state variable here will just reflect the change in the web app itself, okay? Right now the name disappears, right? That's because uh, I just click on okay without typing anything. As a result, now I can no longer click on it anymore. Okay, so how do we avoid this? For us to actually make sure that something actually shows up, okay, right now the right now name is an empty string. So nothing is showing, which is why we can't even click on it. So we can do something called conditional rendering. So instead of just showing name, we do a name or enter name here. Okay, do you see this? Name or enter name here. So what this means is, okay, if I have a name, then I will show it. Because if I have a name, my, my name will be a non-empty string. And if it's a non-empty string, then it will just show the name itself. But if my name is an empty string, then I will show enter name here instead. So this allows me to just click on it 
and now I can finally set my name again. Okay, so um, there's also, there's something else we need to do here because of right now over here we basically just said that okay, just allowed us to click on it to to set our name, but people don't know that this is clickable. So we can also just add an accessibility tag here and we just say that the role is actually a button. So this actually helps uh, people who you know use accessibility tools. Okay, this is very important if you're building web apps because sometimes you know, people who are visually impaired, they might use like screen readers and stuff to use a web app. So we should, if this is a button, we should specify that this is uh, something that can be clicked on. And that's basically how we can make our web app more friendly for users to use. Okay, so now that we've gone through the first guided exercise, okay, we'll just give you all around three minutes to just try it out yourself. If you want to look at the result, you can click on sandbox tool if you want to just look at how the end result looks like and just play around with the code. Okay, we'll have three minutes. Okay, we'll just have around one more minute for you all to play around with it. Okay, we'll just move on. So yeah, just look at my screen again. We'll just be moving on about the next portion. Uh, but yeah, Joshua had a question about how to write comments inside the code sandbox. So if you wanted to write comments in the code sandbox, so um, yeah, so for example, if I wanted a comment here, like I always mentioned, if you want to write JavaScript, you will just use the curly braces here. So just add a curly brace, then you can have like a comment like that, then you can, you can write some comment here. So that's basically how you how you add comments to your React code. But 
So because this is in the JSX portion, but if you have some command that you want to write outside of the JSX portion, you can write it just with your normal JavaScript command syntax. So like this is some JavaScript command. Okay, but you should try to avoid using things like um like that because this won't work. So this slash slash won't work because right now it's inside your JSX body. If you are writing a command inside your JSX body, you should just use the curly braces. Okay. Yeah. So next, I'm going to move on to the next portion, which is about, about refactoring our code into smaller components. Okay. So right now you see in our code sandbox, our code is very long. It's like slightly hard to read. It's not super neat. But in this second sandbox here, what we're going to try to do is we're going to just repackage everything we see here into smaller individual components so that it, our, it makes our code more slightly neater. And I'm going to show you how to do this. So over here, we have the sandbox that I had earlier. And you, as you can see, the code here is super long, right? So I'm going to add a new folder here. So just click this button and I'm going to add this folder called components. So this is where we'll save all our new components here. And I'm, I'm just going to follow the convention that we saw in the slide just now. So we'll have a header, header.js, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy everything that's in the header. So everything in this header tag all the way until the end here. I'm going to just copy it and I'm just going to paste it in, inside here. So for us to properly write like a header uh, component, of course you need like a function. Okay, you can name this whatever you want. So we call this function, we just call this a, a header function and we'll just return everything that we copied over just now. Okay, so header function, just return whatever we copied over just now. And over here, uh, we need to export the function as well. So export default header. So this ensures that this component is exported. But over here, you see that we have this set name here because uh, we didn't copy that over, right? So we also need to move that over. So we'll just go to add and we'll just copy our name and set name to header. And of course, we need to import it as well. So uh, the import is here. We'll just copy it over. So right now, this is a separate component on its own. It's not, it's not, everything is not together into one huge lump here. So now that it's exported in, uh, this component is exported, then we can import it. So over here, we can import, we can import a uh, header from components slash header, okay? So basically what this means is, right? Um, right now our, app, our file is inside app.js. We want the component that resides inside the component folder that's called header.js. We'll import that component and we'll name it header. So we can finally just add the header back to this by just say, just adding the component like that. Okay, so right now it's, it's a lot neater, but actually we can do better than this. So over here, you realize that there are two boxes here. So uh, this is inside header.js. Inside header.js, we have two boxes. We have this uh, overview box and we have a cat fat box. So what I'm going to do is inside the same file itself, we're going to refactor it into even smaller components. So uh, I can just write function cat fat box. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to return the what I copied just now. And um, yeah, it's over here. So over here, I'll just cat tag box. Okay, then same for this. Right now over here, this is the overview box. For this overview box, okay, I'm just gonna refactor it into another component again. So function overview box. Okay, so we have an overview box now, then we can just add it here as well. So overview box. Right, then you realize that we actually, that there's some error here because the set name is now inside overview box. And you realize that 
our state actually doesn't have doesn't have to be inside this header. We, we can just have the state reside inside the overview box itself. So we will just copy it out and just put it back in. Okay, and our web app is back to uh, our the previous functionality again. I can again set my name here and it will still work. So that so now that we clean out header box, we can also do the same for the task list. So for the task list here, uh, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna yeah I'm just gonna copy everything that's in between this main tag. So for from the start of the main to the end of the main, I'm just gonna refactor this into another component called task manager. So task manager.js. Okay, then we'll just uh, function task manager and we'll just return it. And we'll just uh, export default task manager. Okay, so there's some syntax error here, which is why it's not formatting correctly. Let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's a reason why this is happening. Okay, let me just remove this, this React import. Uh, you, you see this like, uh, lots of red lines over here. That's because that's because over here, right? A React component, it can only return one item. Okay, it can only return one item. But over here, I have one div here. I have another div here. I have two items that I'm returning. But the React component actually expects only one item. So for us to properly fix this, right? We can actually just wrap it inside a bigger div. We can wrap it inside a bigger div so that it ends up returning just one item. Okay, and suddenly suddenly the all the errors are fixed. Or the better way that we can do this is because right now this div doesn't make much meaningful sense. We can just use a React fragment. Okay, so this is called a fragment. Basically, you, you just have an open tag that has nothing in it. And you also have a closing tag that has nothing in it. We call this a React fragment. And it will just allow you to return multiple items. And um, it will just be just one singular item that's being returned. Okay, so this is our task manager component. Now we have refactored it. Then of course we need to add task manager as well. So uh, code sandbox is kind of smart. If you just type task manager, it will just help you to auto import and you will just have it working again. Okay, so Basically what we did just now is we made our very long code into a much smaller and much more bite-sized maintainable components. So uh, I'm just gonna give you all some time to just try it out yourself. Okay, so another three minutes for us to just try this uh, sandbox two to sandbox three.
Okay, I'm continuing in 10 seconds time. Okay, so next up, the, what we're going to be going through, I hope you all have some fun trying to, you know, refactor into nice, small, neat components. Okay, so the next thing is we're going to try to make this add task functionality work. Okay, so um, basically you'll just be able to type stuff there and you'll be, you'll be able to click on the add button, but you, it might not display yet. That's, that's the next uh, sandbox that we're going to work, work on, but for now, we're just trying to make, it be, make us be able to add tasks. Okay, so for us to, for, to be able to add tasks, let's just look at the component that handles it. So the component that handles it is called um, task manager, right? And you realize that right now, if I were to click on it and I, if I were to type anything, okay, right now, right now my keyboard, I'm actually like typing certain things. Nothing shows up inside the box over there. So, uh, so the component that's responsible for it is basically this input, this text input over here. Okay. And, and basically what we need to do here is I'm going to introduce you to this um, event handler called on change. So for this event handler that's called on change, basically what it does is it takes in a keyboard event. Okay, it takes in a keyboard event and right now I can just do something like a console.log. Okay, let's just try to see what we get from event uh, dot target dot value. Okay, so Right now, I'm just gonna put my cursor here, and and, and I'm just gonna like type out stuff. So, okay, do you see things showing up in my console? Okay, the the moment I I press something, the on change handler triggers, and you just print whatever I'm typing into the console over here. So, what I want to do now is I want to set whatever showing up in this um text input to be whatever that I'm typing. So for us to do that, we actually need a new state variable here. So import new state from React. Okay, and we're just gonna um we're just gonna have a, another use state. So this use state will just uh at first it'll be blank because this is our text input. So uh we can just call it um add task text, then set add task text. Okay, you can, you can name these variables whatever you want, as long as it kind of makes sense to you and doesn't confuse you. So we have this add task text and set add, add task text. And what's going to happen is I'm just going to, the value that I'm going to display here, I'm just going to set this to add task text. Okay, and whenever I have a keyboard event that changes the Changes what it is what you should display. I'm just gonna ensure that I uh, set the add task text, set the add task text to event target dot value. Okay, so when this happens, I'm able to type here. So because whenever I type anything here, it will just set the add task text to what is inside this box, and it will be reflected inside the add task text, which renders inside your React app. Okay, so. The next question you might ask is why is this event.target.value? And the answer is you just have to follow that is event.target.value. Okay, it's actually a convention. Um, it's a HTML convention that it has been followed over the years. So if you want to figure out why is event.target.value, you can read the MDN, the Mozilla Developer Docs, or you can just follow that is event.target.value. Okay, so now that we're able to type in the box, let's actually make it possible for us to submit it. So for us to submit it, okay, we inside this label, we can have a, we can have an on submit handler. So inside this on submit handler, basically whenever we click on the, we, cl we click on the submit button, okay, we want it to save the add task text somewhere. So for us to do that, we of course need another state variable to for us to store all our tasks. So we'll just call it this task and we'll call this uh, set task, uh, set task. Okay, and because we are storing a number of items inside this task variable, the, well, the default value for it will simply just be an array. Okay, it will not be an empty string. It will, the default value here is an array. So we'll just put a blank array like that. Okay, 
then I'm I'm just gonna like write a function inside here that just helps me to handle submit. Okay. Usually when we write certain like event handlers in React code, we just name it in the convention where we call it handle something like handle X, handle Y, handle submit, uh, handle user click, for example. So in this case, we'll just name it handle submit. And handle submit will just take in a, a, another browser event. Okay. And over here, what I, I want to do is I'm basically going to just add, it, add this to my task array. Okay, so I'm just gonna have my new task. Okay, so this new task is again another array, but this new task will have my new um my new task that I want to add inside it. Okay, so this will be an array, and I'm just gonna create the task that I want inside. So the task that I want basically I will just have a description. So this description will just be the add task text. Okay, and Okay, this might be slightly confusing because of the curly braces, but this curly braces basically means that I'm creating a new JavaScript object. Okay, this curly braces means that I'm creating a new JavaScript object and it has a few attributes. It has a description attribute and I'm going to add a is complete attribute. Okay, so for the task that you are just at, you, you are going to add in, of course, it will not be complete at first. So I'll just add it to false. Okay, so that's how you create a new task object over here. But is, but other than just creating a task object, we also kind of need to uh, append it to all our previous tasks. Okay, so per, per, perhaps you already have like two tasks beforehand and you're adding a third task. You want to ensure that your previous task still exists. So I'm going to introduce you to this new operator called the spread operator. It's three dots and, and then you just write the name of like the variable that you want to spread. So what this means is I want everything inside my task variable and I want to take them out of its array, okay? I want everything inside this task variable and these three dots here basically expands everything that's inside this task array and it will just spread it out so that it will just be individual tasks itself and then I'll append my new task to all my previous tasks over here, okay? So now that I have my new task, what I need to do is I just need to set task to new task. Okay. And right now we still won't be able to. Okay. Yeah. We over here, I haven't added in the, the handler. So I just, I'll just add in handler submit. Okay. And that's how I assign this event handler here. So on submit, I'll run handler submit. Okay, and I'm going to show you something that's quite interesting now, which is if I were to just type something and I, if I were to press add, the whole page will refresh. Okay, let's just try. You see the whole page refreshing. Okay, and that's actually because when it comes to HTML forms, the browser's default behavior when we were to submit anything is to refresh the entire page. So for us to actually stop that from happening, we need to event.prevent default. Okay, event not prevent default basically just overrides the browser's default behavior when it comes to things like submitting a form. So let me just refresh this. And okay, it's not, suppose right now if I want to add a new task and I want to click on add. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically nothing happens because over here you don't really see it being rendered, but I'm just going to console.log uh, our, okay, I'm, I'm going to console.log the new task. Okay, so let's just see what happens when I add something new. So suppose like first to do, okay, if, if I were to click add, you will see it showing up here. Wait, somehow it's still refreshing. Uh, hang on, let me figure out what's wrong. Okay, I think I need to refresh this page. Let me just refresh this, then it should work. I'm 
are we are we coding in JS or HTML here? We are writing React code, which is in JavaScript, but we are just writing it in JSX, which is kind of um like HTML. So to answer your question, I think it's kind of a little bit of both, but not specifically either. Okay, so I refresh the page, so hopefully it doesn't bug on me now. So if I were to just type like first pass and I click on add. Okay, I'm, I think I have to visit this link itself to be able to show you how it works. Okay, so I open up my console here. If I were to add like the first task. Uh, okay, the first task. Okay, this isn't working somehow. Let me figure out what is wrong with this um at task it should be working it might be a code sandbox but okay I, let me just try this out again Oh wait, oh yeah, okay. Somebody told me what's the problem here. Uh, yeah, I actually added it to the wrong attribute. It should be added to the form instead of the label. Oops. Yep, okay. So let me just refresh this again. Okay, so it, right now if I were to just add a task, I click on add. Okay, you see like the first object here, which is, which is our first task. Then let me add on the second task. So second task. If you click on add, then you see the second task here as well. Okay, so yeah, thanks for helping me point out the mistake. I, I didn't notice that I added it to the wrong attribute. So yes, um, that's how you add tasks. But right now, we, we are still not able to display it yet. So actually, for now, I'm just going to move on to the next sandbox as well. So for the next sandbox, okay, we are going to display the added task over here. Okay, so over here, just earlier on, we made it possible to add tasks, but it's not the, the new task that's being added is not being displayed. So you actually want to display the added tasks. So for us to actually do this, okay, right now we have this whole list of tasks over here, and right now they're all hard coded. So you have TR, TR, and then the third TR as well. So these are the three rows that's hard coded inside here. So instead of having these three hard-coded rows, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use JavaScript, okay? So this task variable stores an array of all my tasks, and I'm just going to map it, okay? I'm going to map it to a React component. So this map function in JavaScript, it takes in a function that specifies what to render to. So I'm going to take in the... First, it will take in the task, and I also want, I'm also interested in taking in the index. Okay, and, and basically over here, we get to decide what we want to render. So I'm just going to copy this and move it inside here. And over here, the number that we want to render is basically just index plus one. Okay, and over here, the description is basically just the task dot description and for the whether it's checked or not okay it's just a task task dot is complete so if it is complete then you'll be checked if it's not then it won't be checked but over here we also need to have like uh, something called a react if we, react requires us to have a key so it kind of needs a key for it to compare to see what has changed inside the list. So we need to pass in this key attribute. And over here, we need something that uniquely ident identifies our to-do item. So we can just pass in something like task.description, something along these lines. Then if, if I were to save it, then um, okay, so over here, basically I need just I just need to change this to like 
um, these brackets, then it will be working. Yeah, okay. So suppose right now if I were to add like some to do, and you, you see it show up here, then another to do, and if I were to add it again, you see it show up here. Okay, so what's happening here is every time you add a to do, it will just add it to this task array here. And after adding it to this task array, it will just render it inside the table body itself. It will just take whatever's inside the task array. And based on the task, as well as its own index, it will map it to a specific row. And the, for the row, we'll just construct the number with the index. We'll just construct it with the task description. We'll just construct it with whether it's complete or not. Okay. So over here, you see this few other stuff that's not relevant anymore. So I'll just delete them. And yeah, so that's basically how you add tasks. And right now, I'm just going to give you all some time to just explore this yourself. And you can either try out from Sandbox, Sandbox 3, 4, or just look at Sandbox 5 to look at the completed result. Okay, and three minutes for you to try this out, and you will start now. Okay, another 10 seconds before we begin again.
Okay, let's move on. So, yeah, so, okay, to answer VDK's, VDK's question, uh, yes, the task get cleared whenever a browser refresh is done. So that's what we'll be covering later afterwards on how to persist it to the browser. So uh, because the state variable, basically you can think about it as like, as, it's like a runtime variable. So whatever is stored in the state, it will just be cleared every single time. Um, okay, so how do we choose the key value? That's a good question. Uh, for the key value, basically, um, if you were to not have the key value, right? Uh, okay, let me just close this. Yeah, if you were to not have the key value, okay, React will basically complain. So if you if I were to remove it, then uh, it will still work. So let me just refresh it. Okay, I will just run like uh, an add to do. Okay. Um, React will complain and say that each child in the list should have a unique key prop. Okay, so why this matters is because uh, React kind of needs to know how to uniquely identify every item in your list so that when something changes, it will be able to more efficiently determine what has changed so that it can quickly re-render the parts that needs to be changed. So if you are right to that, if you don't choose the key value, it might still work, but sometimes it's a good practice in React code for us to just um, have a key prop that just says like, um, that uniquely identifies each item in a list. Okay, so I hope that answers Ruth's question as well. Would an index be a better key? So uh, index will also work. Uh, okay, so in this case, this key might be a bad key because in the case of you having to-dos with like, uh, okay, suppose it, okay, right earlier on I had this key equals to task description. Suppose if you have tasks that have like identical descriptions, right? Then this would be a bad key. Then if that's the case, then maybe you want to use, use a index, okay? But most of the time, uh, people discourage using index as a key because uh, sometimes suppose if you have like new data coming in and it needs to be inserted in like a certain position of like an array, then you might end up having a same index as something else but yet still have different content. So React might not know how to efficiently re-render that as well. So I would say this is based on case by case basis. So, but for this workshop, we just follow task description. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna move on. Oh, yes, if you were a bit lost with the whole key discussion, you don't have to be worried because the key discussion is actually quite an advanced React concept. If you don't really understand it, it's still it's fine as well. Okay, so next, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do learn about something called props, okay? Props is basically data that's passed from a parent to a child component, okay? So props are passed by the parent component as a field. So for example, if I have a task list uh, component, okay, I can pass in any variable I want into this field that's called task, okay? So props are accessed by the child component from the first parameter of the function. So suppose you have a child component, okay? In the function itself, you can have a first, um, first parameter that's called props, okay? Usually we name it props, you can name it whatever you want as well. But usually we just, by convention, we name it props. And suppose if I, if I wanted to access um, this task that was passed inside this component, right? I can just access it with props.task, okay? So, um, how this is useful is I'm gonna just, again, have another guided demonstration of how we show a no task message instead of a blank table, okay? So let me explain this uh, task over here. Essentially, if I were to refresh this page right now, okay, you will see that, let me just remove this thing, okay? You will see that if I have no task, right, my task list is just a very weird looking table. It has nothing in it. So I, I kind of want to show a message that says, okay, I don't have a task here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to refactor this into its own task list component again. Okay, I'm going to just change this to, um, hang on. Let me just look at the task. Yeah, so, Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just change this whole thing 
Okay, over here I have this entire task list and I'm just gonna change this entire table to its own component. So over here, I'm gonna create a new component. So function task list, okay. And we're just gonna return the exact same table. Okay, except in this case, instead of just rendering it from task from above, right? I'm gonna take in a prop, like a props, okay. Then I'm just gonna say cons task equals to props dot task. Okay, so I've created a new task list component that takes in a task as a okay task as a prop. And I'm gonna just use it to I'm just gonna edit here. So I'm just gonna task this. And if I were to just pass in nothing, right, you realize that you give an error because task is undefined. So right now I need to pass in a task prop. Okay, so task prop, and I need to pass in a variable to be passed as a task prop. And the variable is just task itself. Okay, so what you see here is we are back to our original, our original functionality again. So again, first to do, you see it shows up here. Okay, but right now what I want to do is I want to show a message if I don't have a task. So what I'm going to do is, again, I, I'm writing JavaScript. I'm just going to check if the task.length, okay, if task.length is more than zero, then I will render this task list. Okay, but if the task length is actually zero, okay, then I will render a message that says, uh, that, that says uh, no task added, add some above. Okay, and let's look at this. Right now you still see the to do here. So if I were to add like another to do, it will still show up correctly. But if I were to refresh the page, then the whole table, the whole task list won't render at all. The whole task list won't render at all because we did something called conditional rendering. We're checking whether the length of the task is more than zero. But right now the length of the task is zero. So because the length of the task is zero, this ternary expression here, okay? This question mark and this colon, we call this a ternary expression. It will just, make us render the false case. So the false case just makes us render no task added, add some above. Okay, so right now the moment, if I were to add like, like add something, the moment I add a first to do, okay, what happens is React knows when to selectively re-render it because right now the task variable has changed, the task state has changed, and now the task length is actually more than zero. And because it's more than zero, then it will show render the task list. And the task list takes in this new task that we passed in as a prop, which is why you see the first to do here. Okay, so that's essentially it for this um, portion of the exercise. And we'll just have another uh, three minutes for you all to just try it out.
All right, another 10 seconds and we'll move on to the next exercise. Okay, so, um, okay, let's move on to the next exercise. So over here, basically we need to introduce you to this concept called immutability, okay? Um, so if you come from programming languages like Python or like uh, Java, you might be used to, you know, just, ha just having like a variable that you can constantly modify the value. So when you modify a value, we call, we call that mutation of a variable. But in React, it tries to follow this principle where it tries to keep everything immutable. Immutable meaning that uh, suppose you have an array, suppose you have an array of two items and you want to add a third item to it, you don't just add on to that array. You create a brand new array instead with the previous two items and, your, and then your third item added to it. Okay, so let, let me just repeat that. Uh, the difference is between whether you add on to the previous array or you create a brand new array that has the same items as the previous array. So uh, immutability basically just means that, okay, you are creating something that has a brand new identity, but yet can still contain the previous items. So basically what, what, why React tries to follow this principle of like, do, like uh, conforming to immutability is because uh, there will be less side effects. You, you don't end up like modifying some array that's from like a few states ago you always ensure that you create a brand new array that is, uh, that is what your app wants, okay? And there'll be less side effects. And the rule of thumb is try not to mutate your variables directly. Then always try to create a copy of objects or values when you change your state, okay? So um, why immutability is useful is because it helps React to compare and detect changes. So. Um, over here, suppose you have a current state and then your new state, okay, you change uh, Y to 4, for example. It kind of needs the old version and the new version for it to compare to see what needs to be changed, which is why React is very, um, a lot of the variables we use in React is, it conforms to immutability. Okay, so why this is important is I'm just going to show you this task completion toggle. Actually, we've been doing immutability uh, since the start of the workshop, uh, over here you see that over here we have this new task array. This new task array, basically what it does is it we we could have just done something like a task dot uh, task dot push, okay. But if we were to do task dot push and if we were to just push this new object into the previous array, this would be called mutating the previous array. But because we wanted to conform to immutability what we actually did is we, we actually just created a brand new array and then we spread the previous task and added the new item to the end. So there's a slight difference here. The difference is just the identity of the array. We actually created a brand new array. Okay, so right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we, we're gonna add this task completion toggle. So when I want to click on the completed thing, it should actually toggle my task to become uh, ticked and unticked and so on. So over here, uh, basically what we need to change here is we need to change our task list. So inside the task list here, we need to change this checkbox, okay? When we click it, we want to make, make the, is complete uh, check and so on. So basically how we do this is we just add the on click handler, on click handler and, and um, we, okay, let me just, Look at this and you okay, just give me a moment. I'm just trying to ensure that I'm looking at the correct thing. So yeah, um, yeah, we shouldn't be using on click. I think we should use on change instead. So on change, okay. On change, basically, when this happens, we want to handle the task completion. Okay, handle task completion toggle. And so let's just try to write a function to do this handling of the task completion toggle. So over here, I just have a function, handle task completion toggle. Okay, and 
over here, over here, previously we already, um, we, we already have a list of tasks. So what we want to do is we want to just uh, based on the type of task we take. Okay, over here we know that we, we can find out what's the type of task we take here by passing in the index. So I will just pass in the index. And yeah, I'll just pass in the index. And over here, um, yeah, over here, we are just taking the index as well. Then we also pass in the task as well so that we can just set the task to, to be ticked. So we're passing the task as well as the index. And over here, we'll just um, set, okay, we'll just generate the array of the new task. So the new task basically is just um, what we had so far. So the task over here, let me just check if I wrote it correctly. The task, we will just um, task, we'll just slice it, okay, from the first item to the current item that we want to modify, which is an index. So from the first item, from the zeroth item to the up to the current index we want to modify, and then we will spread it. Okay, then this is the specific index that our task is currently at. So suppose if like I'm modifying, I'm taking the, the, the third task. So this will be actually at index number two at the moment. So what I want to do is I want to reconstruct the task. So um, hang on, actually this should, be, this should be task and not task. Okay, because we're talking about the specific task we want to mark as complete. Okay, so over here, we'll just um, mark the, we'll just recreate the object for the current task. And we just, we'll just say that the description is the same as the task.description. Okay, and then whether, for the, whether it's complete or not, we'll just set it as not task.isComplete. Okay, so why not task dot is complete? Because if it's true, we want it to become false. If it's false, we want it to become true. So this is what we have now. And of course, because we slice from the start to the index, we also need to slice again from the index to the end. So task dot slice and index plus one. Okay, so what this does is we have zero until index, index is exclusive. Then we have the task that you wanted to modify. Then we again slice the task from the next index and onwards. And of course we need to spread it. And this is our new task. Okay. And right now we have our new task. Of course we need to set the task as well. Okay. We need to set the task to new task. And Right now you see that we don't actually have the set task function here. So we actually need to pass down the set task function into this task list. So set task equals to set task. So right now our task list component, instead of taking in just the task prop, it also takes in the set task function. Okay, props.set task. And when this happens, Okay, you realize that everything is, there's no, there's no syntax errors anymore. So let's try to tick it and see whether it works. Okay, we can tick it and it becomes complete. We untick it, it becomes not complete. Let's add a second to do. And maybe a third one. And when we tick it, okay, it marks it as complete. We untick it, it marks it as not complete. So what's happening here, suppose if I were to tick the second one, this handle task completion toggle is copying every previous task. Okay, it's copying the first task. Then it's reconstructing the second task that I'm taking here. The second task I'm taking is reconstructing it, is setting the task to be set to is complete. Okay, then it copies the remaining, the, the remaining task that comes after the, third, the, the second task. So in this case, if I were to take the third task, it would work as well. If I take the first task, it will work as well. So this is how this new task completion toggle, it works uh, because it's immutable. Okay. 
So I hope I didn't lose too many of you all here. You can just kind of intuitively try to understand what's working here. In fact, I also want to introduce you to this new syntax. So as you start to pass more and more props, you realize that, okay, you might end up having many lines of this. So these two lines is actually equivalent to this, okay? Pass and set pass equals to props, okay? So these two lines, they are equivalent to this line over here. So what this means, okay, we call this the structuring of an object, okay? We call this the structuring of an object. Over here, we have this props object, and inside this props object, it has two things that we are interested in. We have tasks and set tasks. Basically, we just want to take them out of this object. So these two lines mean the same as this line. Okay? And that's how we handle the task completion toggle. Okay, I'm going to give you all three minutes to explore this as well. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Right, I will begin in 10 seconds. Okay, moving on. So the next thing that we're gonna do is, you realize that most of our functionality is done now. You're able to add, you're able to mark it as complete. You are able to just see them as well. But we have this thing that we have yet to resolve yet, okay? Which is we want to show the number of tasks that's not complete inside the overview box. Okay, so there's some slight difficulty with this 
sandbox. And as it, this sounds like difficulty with this problem here, and I'm going to explain why. So let's look at where our task is stored at the moment. Our current, currently, our task okay, is stored inside um, it's stored inside task manager. So our task is a state that lives inside task manager. But the thing is, our header, okay, the, the information where it's required to know how many tasks are not complete is inside this overview box. So inside this overview box, we want to display how many tasks are not complete, right? So how do we access the state of the task that resides inside task manager when it's inside this overview box. Okay, it's kind of difficult because we have to do something called lifting of state. Because right now, okay, we have, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to this thing called the React Dev Tools here. So over here, there's this thing called the React Dev Tools. You realize if you click on it, you realize that you can see the hierarchy of all our components here. In fact, if you mouse over certain components, it will highlight okay, how the components are nested with each other. So over here, like I mentioned, the state lives inside the task manager. Okay, In fact, if you were to click on it, it even tells you what's the state over here. Okay, Inside the hooks here, you see a state. It will tell, tell you what's the first description, second description, and third description. And the state lives inside task, task manager, but we actually need it inside overview box. So we have to do something called lifting of state where basically instead of storing the state inside task manager, we store it inside the, the lowest common ancestor component. Okay, the lowest common ancestor component, which is the app. Okay, so I'm going to show you how it, this is done. Um, so first, since the task is set as over here as, as a state, right, I'm going to, instead of, Saving the state inside this task manager, I'm going to take it in as a prop. Okay, so I'm going to have a um, task as well as set task. Okay, this will be taken in as a prop. Okay, and I'm just going to take in the props here. So I've removed the state. Now, of course, I have to move the state up into the app. So the app inside here, okay, we have to store the state over here. Then of course we have to import new state. Um, import new state from React. Okay, so over here earlier on I said that I need I need to pass this in as a prop. So I, of course I need to specify the props. So task equals to task, and set task equals to set task. Okay, when this happens, I will, I will get back the original functionality so I can write first, I can write second, and then we can try to see whether it, the ticking still works. Yes, it still works because the only thing we did is we shifted our state all the way to app. Okay, then since now, our overview box needs the task. So what we need to do is we just need to pass it all the way down to header and from header to overview box. Okay, so I'm just going to pass in task equals to task. Okay, and then the next question you might ask is, do we need to pass in set task or not? And the answer is no, we don't have to because over here, this number here, we are only concerned with how many tasks. We, don't, we are not actually modifying the task. So you only need to pass in the state variable as a prop. Okay, then we go into header. Header, this is our header component. And of course, we'll destructure the prop again. So task equals to prop. Props, OK? So this, we change this component taking a props. And we know that overview box needs the task. So of course, we'll pass it in again. So task equals to task. And in overview box, we will change this to take in the props. Okay, so you need to realize that this is actually passed a few levels down. It's passed from, it was created in app, we pass it to header, and then from header, we pass it into overview box again. Okay, so for us to actually determine how many tasks are not complete, we actually just need to calculate it, right? So number of tasks undone, something, something like that. You can name whatever variable you want. 
what we need to do is we just need to take the task and we just need to filter it. Okay, we just need to filter it by whether the task is complete or not. So task dot is complete. Okay, so the, the task that is undone, right, is the task that is not complete, right? So we filter it by the task that is not complete. And we'll just get the length of it. Okay, so this gives you the number of the tasks that are undone. So instead of just hard coding four tasks, I'm just going to write some JavaScript again. And inside this curly brace, I'm just going to write num task undone. Okay, so right now it says you have zero tasks that are not complete. But if I were to add a task like hello and first, okay, you, it, it will, you, you see that it reacts to your update. Okay, I hope you see why it's called React now. Because whenever I add a new task, okay, and I add it to my state, all my states they are linked together, and all my props they are all reacting to this change. And you see that you have three tasks that are not complete. Okay, suppose if I were to tick it, I tick it because of the way the all my state and everything is linked together, and how my props are all linked together. You see, you have two tasks that are not complete, and if I were to tick everything. You have zero tasks that are not complete. Okay, so that's how we lift the state up and get this uh, state to be lifted to the app level and how we pass it down to the child components and make it work. So basically what we did over here is we have four tasks that are not complete. So overview box kind of, kind of, need, kind of okay, overview box needs to know the tasks but our tasks are stored in task manager. And the children cannot pass props to parents. Only parents can pass props to children. So for us to get the task over to the overview box over here, we need to leave the state to add. Okay? And once you leave the state to add, then we can pass down task as a prop. We can pass down task as a prop to whoever needs it. Okay? So this is called lifting state up, and state should be passed from parent to child as props. Okay, and I'm just going to give you all like another two minutes to just look at this sandbox 8. And yeah, this is the link to the sandbox 8. And the next section of the workshop will be taught by Zizi. If you have any questions, feel free to, let, to, to, answer, to ask any questions now. Yep, thanks, Chris. Okay, sandbox 8. I hope everyone has seen the link. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Yeah, I'll give you until 11.55 to uh, see the sandbox eight. After that, we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Yeah, uh, now let's talk about API calls. So actually what are API calls? Uh, okay, let's look at it. Yeah. So um, API is something that allows two applications to talk to each other. And it's basically we need to ask a web server to do something for us and we wait for the server to give us a feedback. Uh, like for example, if, if let's say uh, an, an analogy is that we make a Telegram um, chat with our friends. And when we send a message to our friends, we actually need to wait for our friends to respond to us. And for example, if we want to ask them to go out for a dinner together, and then we need to ask them for the uh, available days and then we process the data, etc. So 
Similarly, the same, same kind of logic apply here. So what we want to do now is to have some asynchronous function that returns a promise to us. So if you have taken a 2030 or taking, you will know that it's something similar to completable future in Java. So what we want to do here is we want to fetch some kind of data from web server and we process, process the data and use the data to display on our web server as we have shown in the beginning of the web, uh, workshop. So what is fetch actually? So fetch is a built-in function that exists in all major browser. So it's not something like very specific to React. It's a web server, uh, a web server kind of uh, feature. And uh, it can be used to make a application program interface call. So that's what API stands for. Yeah. And it returns a promise in Java. Okay, and let's see the syntax. So actually we will first provide a URL to the link. So if we, okay, let's try to Google this link. Okay, if you Google this thing, right, in the raw data, we will see it provides us with a fact of a, of a cat, and then it will provide with a length of how long the sentence is. And if we refresh it, uh, it will give us another fact. So it's actually a random fact of cat generator. So yeah, we will just uh, refresh it and we get a new data. So what we want to do now is we want to uh, fetch some kind of cat fact and display it here. So yeah. Uh, and uh, after that, we will need to generate. We will need to process the response and uh, try to log it. So, uh, in that case, we also need to perform some kind of uh, uh, side effects in the function components because we want to. Uh, what we want to do is after we fetch the cat fact, we want to update it, update the some cat fact to the uh, the fact we, we have fetched, and uh, it's an asynchronous function because we need some loading time for the API to respond to us. So. Uh, we also need to, uh, we actually basically need to watch the function. Uh. So how we can achieve that is to use the use effect hook. So just now uh, Chris have used the use state. So like it's with this, uh, we, we define a state and we use it. And now we need to use the effect. So what use effect do is it observes the dependencies array. So what is the dependency array is uh, the thing in the red. So it's an array of things of the state we want to watch. And uh, it will run the effect of we define in the function provider if there is change to the dependencies. Okay, so use effect just means I want to watch some kind of state. And if there are a change in the state, I will do something that provided in the function. Okay, so uh, let's try it here. So we'll give you three minutes for this sandbox state. Uh, you can do it, uh, you can use the, use this kind of function here. So basically I want to fetch something from the cat fact. I want to display it in the box. Yeah, so we we'll start talking at 58. Okay, maybe I will do a demo of how you can use the use effect in the uh, in React. Okay, so let's look at the sandbox data. So, okay, we need to first locate where is the thing we want to update. So first we want to know like, okay, this is the cat fact we want to update, right? So for example, first we need to update. Okay, we, we need to declare a state. So for example, maybe I want to call it a uh, cat fact. I want to set cat fact. Yeah, so I use use state. So uh, now because before we fetch the cat fact, right? We want the default cat fact. So for example, maybe we call it loading, uh, loading facts. That just means if I, there's nothing in the cat fact, I will just uh, display default a uh, loading cat fact by, by default. So uh, now we need to update the cat fact we display. 
uh, will be here. And we change it to the state variable we have declared. Okay. Okay. Uh, now you see under the cafe of day is displaying loading cafe, uh, loading facts. Uh, and uh, we can just change it and we will load hotly. Okay. And uh, now we need to uh, fetch the cafe from the API call. So what we're going to do is we copy paste a chunk of code here. Uh, okay. So we will have a use effect. So basically we want to load it every time we, okay. So what we are doing now is we want to load a cat fat uh, every time we refresh the page. So we'll need to use effect to achieve that because we want it to watch that. Okay, I refresh a page that I want to perform this kind of fetching of data from the API call. Okay, so we need to use use effect. In the use effect, as we just mentioned, we will have a function. Okay, we're gonna write, write function body later and we will have a dependency array that we want to watch. And now because we just want to uh, load the cat fat uh, when, it, when we refresh the page. So we don't actually need to pay, uh, put anything inside the load, in the, load, the dependency array. That means we don't watch any variable. So it will just only activate when uh, I first refresh the page. Okay, so now, in the use effect, as we have said, we need to fetch uh, from the HTTPS, uh, okay, it's cafe.ninja. Yeah, this is just a URL of the, of the server. And then after we fetch the data, it will, it will give us a response, right? Then now we need to convert the response to a JSON object that we can process. So, this is the response we get, and how we can process it is to convert it to JSON. Okay. Okay. Then after that, we actually need to uh, get um, the fact, right? So let's look at back at the API call. So if you look at the raw data, this is a JSON raw uh, draw object, right? And we want to get the fact only, and the key of this fact is called a fact. So we could just call data dot fact to fetch this kind of uh, fetch this sentence. So what we will do now is process the data. Okay, this is the data we have. We're going to get the fact from this data by calling data.fact. Okay. And okay, let's try to refresh it. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Oh, and uh, this is to get the data.fact. And now we want to set the cat fact, right, to the fact we have fetched. So actually we need to use the set cat fact. Okay, you will see there's something rendering. So let's try to refresh the page. Okay, you will see another uh, cat fat is rendered. And just now you uh, observe that uh, for a short moment, right? There's a loading cat fat. That means that's a moment where the, uh, where the call, the fetch call is waiting for the server to respond to it. Yeah, so if you de uh, display the loading cat fat, which is a default display uh, at that moment until it get a cat fat from the server. So let's try to refresh again. Yeah, you will see the same pattern here. Yeah. So basically, if you do not put in anything in the dependency array, it just means I want to perform this action once when I refresh the web, uh, the website. Okay. So, and now we need to handle another case. So, uh, what happened? Let's say what happened if I fetch uh, like I type the URL wrongly? What will happen? It will just uh give me a syntax error, which is not desirable, right? So what we want to do is want we want to catch this kind of error. So how we can catch the error is to have a catch statement. And inside the catch, we will have an error. So what we're going to do with the error is we want to display an error message. So unable to fetch cat, uh, unable to fetch uh, cat fat. Okay. Then we want to display the error message. So uh, what we can do is so we have a string, then we append the string with the error we have. So let's try to uh, refresh it. Uh, let me see, what's wrong with it? Okay, same thing, I still need to set the cat fat to this string I want to display. 
yeah, because that's a, ultimately that's what we display on the screen. Now. Okay, so now because the URL is wrong, right? There's nothing uh, I can fetch from the server. So it will be, the error will be called by this statement. And uh, after that, it will set the cat fact to, uh, are able to fetch cat error. Okay, so now uh, uh, it will be a, a advanced uh, like syntax. Uh. So what you can do now is you do need to actually use the string and the concatenation. Uh, what you can do is to use a back tick. This is a special syntax here. So how can I use the, the tick is that this will be a string. And uh, if I just want to display the arrow in line, I can have a dollar sign and the curly bra uh, braces. Inside the curly braces, I can just put the literal I want to display. So this is called a uh, template literal. What it does is after uh, I put a dollar sign here, right? Inside the dollar sign, I can display a value. So this is the value I want to display here. So it will be rendered in line. This will be a neater, um, representation of how you can uh, display a variable a variable like inside a string. Okay. So in conclusions, in this thing, if you want to use use effect to fetch an API call, there's two things we need to take note. First is um, how we load. Uh, when we first load the, uh, load the API, when the data is not fetched yet, we want to have a default display of the state, which is a loading cat fact. And Another case is if there is error in the API call, we want to catch the error and uh, display an error message instead of a cat fact. Okay. And uh, 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 another syntax we can use is a backtick plus a template literal to simplify the string dis uh, display. Okay. Uh, I'll give you uh, two minutes until 12.06 to digest a bit and ask any questions. Okay, let's now move on to the next section about data persistence. So uh, just now uh, when we see like, okay, we try to add a task, uh, let's call it hello. And if you refresh the page, right, you will notice that, okay, there's no task yet. So this is not de desirable, why? Because we want to kind of uh, let the data persist, let the data to be saved on the server or something, right? So, uh, so like, I don't need to add new tasks every time I refresh a page. So then it will the data I can, uh, I can view it every time I just open my web server, a web browser, right? So what we can do is, uh, what we can do is to true data persistent. It just means I want the data to persist, okay? So uh, there's one way to store it is to use window local storage. So what window local storage is, uh, let's try to view window local storage on the, on the, on the, uh, on the web server, okay? So if you, if you inspect the page, uh, let me open it. If you inspect the page, okay, and you go to storage, or I think some other browser is application, then to storage, okay. Then you'll see there's a local storage here. Yeah, so in the, inside the local storage, you will actually see there are a key and a value. So that means inside the local storage, I can store something as a, uh, as a key value pair. So what we're gonna do now is we want to save the task as key value paths into the local storage so that when I refresh, it will still uh, display the task list I have previously entered. 
Okay, so when we talk about storage, right, there are actually two steps in storing. So first one is we want to store the, the data in the local storage, obviously, right? Then another thing is when I refresh it, I want to get the data from the local storage. So I need to store and then I get the data from the local storage. So uh, when, when we want to store the data, we can use the set item and key value. Because just now we have observed that in the set item, right, uh, in the local storage, I will store them as a key value pair. Yeah, and notice that the value we want to pass in need to be a string. Okay, that might cause the issue later we need to talk about. Yeah, and uh, uh, next step, we'll, we want to get the item using the key. So when we give them a key, they will fetch the value that's corresponding to that key and return the value to us that we want to do now. Okay, so that's the two stage we want to, we want to care about. Okay, uh, because of time constraint, I'm just gonna to do a demo of how you're gonna to fetch the, uh, how you're gonna to store and fetch the tasks. So remember just now we have moved uh, uh, in the stage of the lifting state up, right? We have moved all the tasks to the app. Uh, so if we want to store the task to local storage, we also need to do something to the app, right? So let's look at the app. Okay. So when we set, uh, when we pass in set task as set task, so maybe we can do something here to uh, to make the task to save to the local storage. So what we can do is, uh, I will uh, set uh, set and store maybe set and store task. So now we need to define a set and store. Uh, let's call it a function set and store. Uh, inside, I will have uh, new tasks. Okay. So every time I add a task, I save it to the, the local storage. Okay. So, but, uh, but I, still, I still need to set the task to the state first, right? Uh, so that's a basic function of a state. Okay, so I set the task to the task. And now I want to store it to store to local storage. What I can do is to call window.local storage. And uh, I set item, as just now we have mentioned. Set item means I store it, right? And uh, I pass it a key. Let's call it task. Uh. You can call it anything. In the task, I want to store a new task. New tasks, right? Okay, so, okay, so. The new task, right? What is uh, uh, the new task is actually, uh, is it a string? No, right? It's a JavaScript object. That means I cannot directly pass it in. So let's see what will happen if I just run it. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, let's see on the web browser. I inspect, I go to local storage. Yeah, see it's like, uh, let me try to add something. Yeah, we start as an object object, it's a string. So, so it does, does not tell me anything about what's the description and whether it's complete or not, right? So what I can do now is I want to convert the details to a string. How we can do that is to the, through the function of JSON stringify. Yeah. That means I want to convert the JSON object to the task, uh, to, the, to the string. Okay, JSON just means JavaScript object notation. And uh, after that, it means I have set the item to the task. Okay, so let's try on the, uh, let's try on the web server. Hello. Okay. I've added. Uh, okay, let me see. Yeah, so. When we type hello, right? Although the task is not displayed yet, okay, we will see like the task is uh, stored as a description hello and it is complete false. That because we have already con converted it to a string. Okay, so now what we need to do is to, uh, because just now we have seen that the task list, right, is not rendered anything when we type in. So we need to use the use effect to fetch the data from the local storage every time I refresh the page. So what we can do is to use something similar as we talk about use, use effect, right? Use effect. Because use effect, if I do not pass in any independencies, it will just means I refresh and I perform this action once, right? Okay, so now let's write the use effect. We basically want to set the task to, some, some, to, to, the, 
to the storage, uh, to the data we have fetched from the uh, local storage, right? So first we need to actually get the item from the local storage. Yeah, okay. So just now we have mentioned, we just need to have the key for the local storage, right? So that's called, uh, the, and the, we have mentioned the key is called task. So we need to get item of task. Okay, and uh, let's call it constant, constant save task. Let's go to save task. And now we can set tasks to the saved task from the list, right? Okay, so, uh, so now what will the, be the problem? Just now we have mentioned that the new task, right, is a JSON, is a JavaScript object. And now after we convert it to a string, when I fetch it, right, when I get the item, it will return me a string as well, right? But indeed, I just want the JavaScript object. So I need to convert it back to JSON, right? So there is a function called json.pass to convert it back from string to JavaScript object, right? And after I convert it back, I can just set the task to save task. Okay. So that means every time I fetch the, every time I refresh the page, I uh, fetch the data from the local storage and then I set the task to the safe task. Okay. So let's try it now. Um, test. Uh, somehow it doesn't, let me see what happened here. Okay. Uh, it's, Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, here is wrong. Okay. Set task, new tasks, and uh, uh, another one. Okay. There is another. Uh, let me see. Hmm. New tasks. A new task. You need to check if the save task is not now. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks, Chris. So, because there's a problem that my save task might be now, right? So, for example, um, when I just uh, first load the page, it will, it will have no task yet. So my save task will be nothing. Uh. So what I need to do is I check whether there's a, whether the save task is now. If it's now, I render it to a default uh, kind of object. So we'll use this operator, it's called uh, knowledge coalesce. That means I will check whether my save task is now. If it is now, I will render it to an empty array. If it's not now, I will just render it to whatever value is already uh, stored from uh, from the previous statement. Okay, so uh, yeah, if you don't have if you do not have this check, it will just be a syntax error just now. So yeah, so let's try it now. Yeah, so hello and uh, maybe another one test. Okay, then now let's try to inspect and see the local storage. Uh, it'll be in this app. Okay, now you will see. Okay, let me delete this. Yeah. Uh, now you will see like uh, I have a description of hello incomplete. It's complete false. This is one object, right? Uh, this is a one task object, and we have another task object, and uh, they are enclosed in an array. Yeah. So that's how you can use the local storage. And if let's say we delete, uh, we delete the the task. What will happen is if I refresh the page. Yeah, there will be no task because I have already deleted the key value pairs from the local storage. So yeah, that's how you can use local storage to let it to persist on the browser. Okay, uh, I will give you another two minutes to try to digest the part about local storage and uh, uh, ask me any questions. Yeah, for those of you for looking at the same box, you can also try to figure out how to save your name to local storage. 
Because right now, Zixing actually demonstrated how to save the task to local storage. So actually saving the name to local storage is the same concept. She won't demonstrate it, but you can think about how you can get it done. Yep. So think of the two steps. Uh. So you need to first store it and also get the data. Yeah. And after you store and get the data, you actually need to set the state to update the state. Uh. Okay, I think I will move on to the next topic about how you want to, okay. When we do store data in local storage versus database. Okay, so local storage is when you actually just want the data to be on the browser. Yeah, so it's just a local storage thing as suggested. So there will be no access to database. And um, uh, local storage is preferred when you just, uh, you just want, the, there's no like interaction with the internet data. And uh, it's like, uh, it will be a simpler version. So for example, your, the NUS model uh, is, you will see some kind of data, oops, uh, review. Um, so like, if you see the data right in the storage and you go to the local storage, you will see there are some persistent data stored here. So it will be useful if you, you just want some kind of local data and there's no like login, etc. Okay. Yeah, uh, we'll move on to deployment. So here we'll be introducing to you a tool called Vercel. So it's a website uh, that actually can host the, uh, your, your services like free, yeah, for free. And it's very easy to use. So you just need to create an account and push the repo to your GitHub. And you link the GitHub account to the Vercel account. So uh, let's search it. Okay, it's called Vercel. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you have logged in, uh, okay, so this one is already deployed. So you can actually cl click on new op uh, project. And this is linked to your Git, uh, Git repo, or you can add a Git, uh, GitHub account. Uh. Then you will search the repo you want to uh, you want to deploy. So for, for example, I will just import this one. Yeah, then it will automatically uh, deploy for you. So you just need to wait for a few seconds. Uh, and since here I have already deployed this one, so we'll just see what will happen. So if you go to this, deploy app, right? You will be able to have a few domain for the app. So actually this app, you can access the app in this link. This is a global link out. So in, inside here is a free function one. So you can do the thing as we have already uh, mentioned in the, uh, in the workshop. So that means your app is online and now you can send the app to your friends to test it if you want. Yeah. And uh, another cool thing is uh, you can also uh, view the domain and you change the domain to some, some other domain. Uh, so maybe let's call it I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, then, okay, it's not, it's not, it's not valid. Yeah. So you can choose a valid domain and then that means you can just use the newly config URL to access the, the, the app you have deployed. Okay. And uh, after you have linked the, uh, linked your GitHub account to the Vassal account and deploy it, right? Every new commit to the master branch will actually trigger a redeploy. That means, right? Okay. So, uh, I have already, uh, I have already uh, have a report here. So what I'm going to do is to uh, show you. Okay, so if you do not, if it's first time you do it, right? You just uh, git clone. Uh, you copy the URL and then you git clone. Yeah, git clone to a report. So git clone. Then you paste in the the, the URL you have just uh, pasted, and then it will uh, give you a new report. So okay, let me just try to do it again. So uh, key clone. Okay. Oh, yeah, it already exists. Uh, so you can do that. 
And after that, right, you can run the command of, uh, you can run the command of yarn to install all the dependencies you want. To install all the dependencies you want. And then after you, you install the dependencies, right, I can just run a yarn start. Yeah. And uh, you will see at the yarn start, right, it will show me, okay, there is a local host called uh, 3000 that where I can view my, my, my app up. So this is a local host. That means I can, this is a development environment where I can develop the app locally. So if I want to change the app, uh, let me open another terminal. So if I want to open uh, the, the, the app, okay. I'm just going to open it in Visual Studio. Okay, it's already open. And inside the Visual Studio, right, you will see the code I have, uh, I have already git clone. And if I want to uh, maybe modify something, uh, let's modify the header. Uh, modify the header, okay. Let's modify the name to be the team. Okay. Then it will be, it will be rendered immediately. Okay. So you can also change the name, anything else. So like it's a development environment you can, where you can uh, uh, write your code and test your code locally uh, using Visual Studio. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see if I, okay, I have changed the name to be the thing, right? And now I want to uh, make it change in my production environment. Uh, so basically I want to make it change like in the internet version as well. What I can do is, okay, I'm going to open a terminal. What I can do is I can commit my change to the GitHub a remote a repo. So let's see. Okay, now I have changed my packages on. Okay, this one I'm not going to commit. Uh, and I have changed this header file because of this line of change. So what I'm going to do is to git add uh, SFC. Yeah, so in my git status, I will able to see that, okay, uh, I have uh, this one will be the commit I want to change up. So I will give commit, I'll give commit message up. So it's a short form. So, but yeah. let's say update the save name. Yeah. So now I want to push it to the repo. So if it's the first time you create a repo, you might not be able to push it, but it can just follow the command that the git uh, prompt to you. Yeah. So after I push. Okay, that means I already pushed. And if I go back to my uh, repo, okay, if I go back to the repo and refresh, yeah, you'll see, okay, this is the latest commit. Okay, update the safe name. Yeah, and I have already updated the name. So what will happen? Okay, that's a cool thing about Vassal is that if you, uh, if you render the change and redeploy re the app based on the next uh, newest commit, Okay, so you will already see that in the branch, right, is the main branch and the latest commit is update the safe name. That means my branch is redeployed. Okay, so let's see, it might take a few minutes. Yeah, okay, so now you see, this is my remotely deployed app, right? And the, now my name is already changed to the team. Yeah, so that's a cool thing about Wasau that you can, uh, you can just redeploy your commit uh, instantly. Okay. and uh, uh, if, if let's say uh, you want to protect your main branch, that, that's like, I don't want to, every time I push a commit, then I re redeploy. I just want to uh, make sure this version works, then I deploy. So what it means is you can create a new branch. Okay, so create a new branch and call it a production branch or, de redeploy, uh, or like a deployment branch. And then, okay, let's look at, uh, uh, let me see. I think it's a, uh, Okay, yeah, so like under the gear, right, you will see a production branch. That means every commit pushed to that branch will be deployed. So I can just change the branch to something like production. Yeah, or like a deploy. So like every time I want to, I want the production version to change, right, I just push all the changes to this branch instead of the main branch. So that, that way you can just protect your changes until it's ready to be deployed. Okay, uh, that is something about the deployment. Okay. I think we have went through all the main part of the workshop. So now we're going to do a bit of summary. So this is the finished product as Chris have deployed. So you can have a look at it and toggle around. Yeah.
And uh, we just want to recap a bit. So first components are the building blocks of React. And uh, it's just uh, when we say, okay, we've, it, it's in the format of a function that returns a GSX uh, object. Yeah. And the uh, props refers to the data that pass in from a parent to a children component. And remember that you cannot pass it back from children to parent. So whenever you want to see the pattern of you want to pass something from children to parent, you need to lift up the state to the parents. Okay, and state refers to the data stored within the component. We have been using state quite frequently in this workshop. And state just means a data that's stored, okay, within that component. So like it's uh, something unique to the component that will be changed, okay. And when props or state have changed, the component is re-rendered. Uh, if states need to be shared across components, store it in the common ancestor state, okay. And uh, you do not modify, uh, modify the state directly. So this is called something called immutability. Instead, you should make a copy of the existing state and modify it. So it will be safer and neater for you to, uh, to work on the code. Okay. Okay. And uh, we want to uh, have the each React component should ideally has its own file. Lah. So uh, you will, if you see the sandbox, right? Uh, in, the, in the header, we have a function called cat box, cat fat box, and another one called overview box, lah, and another one called header. So uh, if uh, like the most de desirable kind of um, behavior is we want to store them in different files instead of one main file. So we can actually break them down further into like smaller components, right? Uh, and the React application should be structured log logically. So how you can view the structure logic is through the tool we have mentioned, which is React Dev Tool. And you will see, okay, under header, I have an overview box and cat box. And under app, not only I have header, I have a task manager as well. Yeah, so this is called the structure of an app. Yeah. And React components can be imported and exported. So we can use one component in another component through import, uh, importation, okay. And next we're going to uh, briefly introduce to you some developed tools. So first one is a uh, uh, develop dev tools on the browser. So other than sandbox, right, we, we, have, uh, we have seen that uh, there's this uh, something, okay, this is orange, right? The orange sign means it's a React, that tool. So what this tool do is under my inspect, right? Uh, I will have a component, or components and the profiler. So these are the web browsers version of the developed tool. So you can do the same thing as, as the one in the sandbox. Uh. So it, it's very helpful and try to download the extension for your own user. Uh. Okay. And uh, these are the strongly, extremely recommended reading list. So first you need to tidy up the, on the HTML knowledge. So for example, on change, on submit and the prevent default and also the event target value we have mentioned, uh, it, it requires a, a, a lot of uh, HTML foundation actually. So you can just go to the URL and try to learn more about HTML. And uh, you also need to learn about JavaScript. Yeah, because it's a GSX, it's, com it's a com combination, a mixture of JavaScript and HTML, right? Yeah, and uh, other than JavaScript, you can also take a look at the official React tutorial. Okay, this one is extremely useful if you are new to React because if you guide you step by step through building something, like to through set that setting up and building like a game uh, from step to step. Okay, and um, everything in the main concept is a hello world. So yeah, take uh, make full use of the React its own official document is quite good. And uh, another thing is React Hook. So just now in the workshop, we have mentioned about uh, use state, use effect, right? So these are actually called hooks, okay? So you can take a look of a state hook, an effect hook, and uh, other kind of hook APIs as well. So yeah, these are all the React official documents. And moving forward, uh, these are some useful tools. Uh, we would strongly recommend you to have a try of it. So if you're using a uh, VS Code, right? ESLing and Prettier are your, are your good friend. So uh, Prettier will basically help you to auto format the code as just you have seen in the sandbox. So what it will do is to save uh, on format. Uh. So let's say uh, I modify something to make it very nasty. Okay, so now, now like it's, it's, not, it's not formatted like, very nicely, right? Like everything, something is inline, something is not. So if I just control S or, or command S, uh, I just save it. It will automatically format it for, for me. Yeah. So this is the make use of the prettier uh, extension. And if let's say you have downloaded the prettier extension, but it's not working, make sure you turn on the form, format on save function on VS Code. Yeah. So it will be in the setting and then you can, uh, uh, oops, uh, okay, comment. You go to the setting 
Yeah, you, you make sure the ID format are safe is true. Yeah. And ESC is a linter that help you to check whether your code is gram grammar uh, grammarly correct. Okay, so let's see if I have a, uh, how to say, I have a extra, extra bracket. Yeah. Then it will just detect for me and show error message from here. So it will be very useful. And Redux is something uh, uh, very advanced that, that's about like state management because there's a lot of states, right? So how we can centralize the stage and store them in a centralized store is through using of Redux. And uh, we'll have also TypeScript. So TypeScript is actually a super set of JavaScript. So it will be helping you to add types uh, as, it, as the name suggested to the language. So it will, you'll be able to have some integer string, this kind of type, and you can define your own types in TypeScript. Uh, so you can try that out as well. Yeah, okay. Then you can also, um, uh, take a look at the part two, which is more advanced stuff. And uh, it will uh, tell you how to move on from the current, uh, <laughs> move on from the current uh, to do app to a new to do app. So yeah, uh, it will be using Firebase, if I'm not, Firestore, yeah, Firestore and uh, Firebase. Yeah. So yeah, uh, is VS Code sufficient to develop for purpose on Mac or is Visual still new? Uh, VS Code. Yeah, VS Code is sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think that's the end of our workshop. Yeah, thank you guys for staying along with us. And uh, yeah, we overrun uh, quite a bit because we want to really go through the concepts with your like in depth. So yeah, if you could help us to fill in this feedback form, it would be it would be very good for us to know how we can improve on our teaching. And don't be uh, discouraged if you uh, are lost in anywhere in the workshop because it's meant to be uh, a bit challenging. So like later you can also read the concept and digest on your own. Yeah, thanks for coming everyone. If yeah, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now. I think Zicheng and I will just stay for a few more minutes. Uh, if not, yeah, like what she mentioned, help us to fill up the feedback form, we'll appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, this workshop uh, will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you have any question, you can just. Uh, what we learned today is React Native. Yes, it's a very basic uh, version of React. Yeah, yeah. You haven't you haven't really touched uh, Native uh, and Redux. Yeah.